Good evening. Welcome. Hello. Welcome. I am so pleased um, to be welcome you, welcoming you to the Civic Awareness Series here at Cantini Park. The League of Women Voters and Cantini have been partnering together since 2016 on this project. Barb has been a big part of that, as well as many different faces here at Cantini. We're so honored to have had such a long relationship with the League, and sad to see that this will likely be one of the last programs here at Cantini, but we're confident that the Civic Awareness Series and the League will continue on. We hope to host you again sometime in the future, but for next year's programs, this will likely not be happening here at Cantini. Um, and for tonight's programs, I am happy to introduce um, Bob Berlin. Bob has been a career prosecutor for 36 years. He began his career in 1987 as an assistant state's attorney in Cook County. In his 36 years, year career as a prosecutor, Mr. Berlin has tried 87 felony jury trials, 58 of which involved first degree murder. Mr. Berlin has also tried hundreds of felony bench trials, including more than 50 homicide cases. He is a frequent lecturer on a variety of criminal justice issues and has testified before the Illinois State Criminal Law Committee and the Illinois House Judiciary Judiciary Committee on Numerous Criminal Justice Bills. And as a note of housekeeping, there will be a question and answer at the end of the program. Barb has walked through the crowd and handed out note cards. Should you have a question, please fill out a note card and indicate to um, the league at, um, that you have the question and they will read that question on your behalf. Thank you so much for coming and welcome to Bob. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, got a lot to talk about. It might help if I get my clicker here. OK. And I will try and save uh, some time for questions. So let's start first with what it, the mission of the state's attorney's office is. Uh, and it really comes down to public safety. Uh, but uh, our mission is to seek justice for the people of DuPage County with integrity, courage, and professionalism. Uh, and we're guided by two major concerns, which is protecting the public and defending the rights of victims. Um, and that's, uh, that is the mission that all of our attorneys have uh, in the office. So right now, uh, we have 94 assistant state's attorneys uh, in our office, in both the criminal and civil division. Uh, and that includes three chiefs, six deputy chiefs, uh, seven supervisors, uh, and then we have the first chairs. Between our support staff and prosecutors and the Children's Center, the total number of employees is 169. I'll talk about the Children's Center uh, in a minute, but it is a, uh, it's, uh, a center that has uh, agreements with all the police agencies in the county to investigate and prosecute cases of physical and sexual abuse against children. Um, I included this slide because I think it's important uh, to share with everyone uh, the, the makeup of who are the attorneys uh, in the office. Uh, and the fact is right now, uh, I have three chiefs. Uh, both my chief of criminal and my chief of civil are women. Um, the director of our Children's Center is, is a woman, and three of six deputy chiefs, four of seven supervisors, and 10 out of the 12 first chairs uh, are all women. And in fact, 53% uh, of the attorneys now uh, in the office are females. So let's talk first about felony indictments, and then I'm gonna talk kind of like what the trends are and what we're actually seeing in the county right now. You can see last year we, we charged approximately 2,800 felonies here in DuPage County. Um, you'll notice that there was a big dip uh, a couple of years ago, and that coincided with COVID. All of our case numbers were down. The reality is the police were making fewer arrests. 
fewer people were out uh, for about a two-year period, but we're starting to tick uh, back up uh, to where we have been the past few years, uh, but fortunately uh, not as high as we were uh, back in 2011. And the years before, there were years when we charged 3,500, 3,600 felonies. So the good news is uh, those numbers are down a little. There is some good news uh, in these numbers, okay? If you look at robberies and aggravated robberies, down 43%. Our carjackings, and these are the number of charged cases, down 44%, uh, and armed robberies down 39%. That's all trending in the right direction. Um, and I will share with you that in 2022, out of those 2,800 felonies that we charged, 60% of the defendants are from outside of DuPage County. Uh, so we, we've got them, they're coming from everywhere. They're coming from Cook County, they're coming from Will County, Kane County, uh, and uh, many from out of state as well. Uh, but uh, so clearly what we're doing is having an impact and working on the violent crimes. Uh, but the two big concerns that I have, uh, and you can see those highlighted in yellow, UUW stands for unlawful use of a weapon by a felon. So in Illinois, if you're a felon, you cannot possess a gun. Uh, and you have, we have seen a huge increase in unlawful use of weapon by felon cases, many of them who are coming from outside of the county, and many of them who have very bad criminal histories. The good news there is that our police agencies are doing an excellent job of taking these guns off the street. The other concern, uh, the big increase we've seen up 61% in two years is fleeing and eluding and aggravated fleeing and eluding. Uh, a huge increase in people who get stopped by the police and then they take off. Uh, in many of these cases, the officer will go up to the car, speak with the driver, uh, and then the driver takes off. Or they just don't stop to begin with. And unfortunately, we've seen some high-speed chases going through residential neighborhoods uh, throughout the county. So it is a concern I have. Uh, I have met with uh, and talked to the Secretary of State uh, to see if we can do anything administratively uh, to try and bring those numbers down. All right, let's switch over to uh, juvenile. When I first started in DuPage County, the end of 2004, we had three juvenile courtrooms and we filed over 1,100 delinquency petitions a year. You can see uh, what we've done because in 2022, that 1,100 was down to 285. That's a remarkable accomplishment. Now, does that mean that our juvenile crime has gone way down? It doesn't. Uh, what it does mean is that we're doing a lot more outside of court. Uh, we have incredible resources here in the county. We have the finest juvenile probation department in the state of Illinois. And one of the things about juvenile cases is when we file uh, a petition, the parents are parties to the case. They have to come to court. So when we don't file the case, we make sure that our juvenile probation department gets involved, not just with the minor, but with the, their family as well. Most of the cases where minors are committing crimes, there's something going on in the house. Uh, and we're able to get to the root cause of that and the bottom of that uh, and prevent these kids from committing crimes uh, when they become adults. Uh, at the bottom there, there's another disturbing trend you see, and those are school threat cases. Uh, we take them very seriously. It's not about punishment, but when uh, a 14 or 15 year old student is texting or posting on Instagram or Snapchat that they're going to shoot up a school, there's something very wrong. And uh, we bring them into court with their parents. And again, it's about trying to find out what's going on and help them and get them on the right track. Uh, we know that we cannot afford to make one mistake when it comes to school safety. Uh, and I'll talk about our school safety task force uh, in a few minutes. So we do 
a lot of um, restorative justice. Pick up the newspaper any day, uh, you're going to read about somebody charged with an armed robbery or somebody charged with a carjacking or a shooting um, or somebody got a, a long prison sentence. That's how we handle violent crime. But for nonviolent crime, we take a much different approach. Uh, I've been a prosecutor 36 years and learned a lot along the way. Uh, and these problem-solving courts, which I'm going to go through, are incredible and we get amazing results uh, from what we're doing. There's multidisciplinary teams that are in these courtrooms uh, and we take, take them on a case-by-case -case basis and the goal is to get people on the right track, uh, get them back out on the street. In most of these cases, we have a contract with the defendant that if they complete the program, their case will be reduced uh, or in some, in some cases, outright dismissed. But what it does is it keeps offenders out of jail. So we'll start with our drug court. In, uh, right now, we have 71 active cases in our drug court. These are defendants who have criminal histories. Uh, and they're charged with drug crimes, uh, sometimes charged with theft or forgery, which are clearly the result of an addiction. And they would otherwise be going to prison. But they've committed their crime, and it has to be nonviolent because of a drug addiction. Uh, this is a very difficult program to complete, uh, but it's a program that has great success uh, for those that are able to make it through. Uh, these cases are staffed uh, at least once a month, some more often, uh, where we sit in a room with the judge, with the defense attorney, and we go through one at a time, uh, and, and uh, the probation officer who's assigned to that defendant, and we talk about their progress, what they're doing, make recommendations uh, to help them complete the program. There are, if there are relapses, which often occur in drug cases, there's a system and a step process of sanctions. Um, and it's pretty rare that they will have to go to jail, but sometimes the judges will send them for a short period of time to get them back on the right track. Um, it is a, it's a great program, uh, and as you can see, over 900 have been admitted uh, in our drug court since 2002. We have two tracks. We have a more serious track for those who have lengthy criminal histories, and then we have what we call the drug court light, uh, which are for offenders that don't have the lengthy history uh, but they can still benefit from their program, uh, and we let them in. All right, the next problem-solving court is our FOCUS court. FOCUS stands for First Offender Call Unified for Success. Uh, this was started in 2018 uh, by then uh, Chief Judge Dan Guerin, and his idea was to take all the first offender drug cases and put them in one courtroom so that there would be a consistency in how they were handled. We have over 1,100 cases in this courtroom, both including post and pretrial disposition. And the goal here, again, is treatment. Um, in these cases, if they complete the program, they're on either a 410 or 710 probation, which means that if they complete it, um, they, those cases are dismissed and they can get them expunged. Uh, so they're all handled in front of one judge. Uh, we have uh, three attorneys uh, prosecuting in this courtroom. And again, it's all about getting uh, people help because the reality is all of the research shows if we can cure that drug addiction, um, that's causing the crime. We're going to get people back on the right track and we won't see them again. If you, if you send them to jail, when they get out, they're just going to continue using. And we've wasted all those resources. Um, and it's not good for them, and it's not good for the community, um, which is why this is a great courtroom. Our MICAP is our mental health court, um, our mental illness court. These are, again, nonviolent offenders, uh, but they're Offenders who have committed a crime and there's a nexus between some type of a mental illness and the crime that they committed. We've got 102 active cases in this courtroom 
And again, it works the same way. Uh, they enter into a contract with our office, and if they complete this program, uh, whatever they're charged with, it's going to be reduced or in some cases dismissed. Um, and then we have our veterans court. And we have 23 active cases in this courtroom. Uh, these are veterans, again, uh, many who have PTSD, and they've committed nonviolent crimes. Um, and there's a nexus between whatever they're suffering from and the crime. And it works the same way. There's a contract that they enter into with our office. Cases are staffed. Uh, they appear in front of a judge periodically. We monitor them. And I will tell you this, because I go to the graduations uh, for drug court, for mental, uh, mental health court, for veterans court. There's a feeling that we get as prosecutors, you got a big, let's say it's a big homicide case, and you're on trial for four weeks, and the jury comes back and they found so, someone guilty, and you see the look on the family's face, and you realize that justice has been done. It's a powerful feeling. Sitting through one of these graduations is every bit as powerful. When you see the before and the after, uh, especially in drug court, they do a video for each defendant. There's a video of how they looked and how they were when they came into the program and how they are when they're coming out. And it is truly very powerful. And uh, our drug court, our mental health court, are, are some of the most successful in the country in terms of recidivism. So again, we're fortunate that we've got resources in this county and uh, we have people who are really dedicated uh, to these courts, not just my office, but our public defender, Jeff York, and our private defense attorneys, many of whom are in the building every day, um, all believe in these uh, restorative justice programs. So. Uh, the other program we have is a diversion court. And this is something that I started when I became state's attorney. And again, these are for first time nonviolent offenders, but first time nonviolent felonies. Many of them are retail theft, uh, forgery, some car burglary cases uh, go into this program. And the way it works is this. They submit an application. Uh, they meet with the coordinator for the program and then they will have to appear in front of a citizen's panel. We have two different citizen's panel panels that review these cases, and they ask some very tough questions, and they wanna know that these defendants are willing to make changes and acknowledge what they did. And if they recommend that they get into the program, they'll send that over to us. We have the final say, but we almost always follow the recommendation of the citizen's panel. If they get into the program, they have to plead guilty to the felony offense in front of a judge, but they're not sentenced. And the sentencing is put off for a year. They go through the program and they're going to have to do community service. In many cases, they're gonna to have to complete a number of days of what we call SWAP, which stands for the Sheriff's Work Alternative Program. Uh, those are the people in, in the yellow vests that you'll see sometimes um, painting the sides of the road or picking up trash or painting buildings, folding laundry in the care center. They'll have to make restitution if, if restitution is required. And if they stay clean for a year and they do everything they're supposed to do, then they come back into court, they can withdraw their plea of guilty and the case is dismissed and they can get an expungement. Uh, and it's a great way of handling those kinds of cases for nonviolent offenders. For um, looking at whether people who complete this program get arrested within one year, we have a 97% success rate, which is really incredible. Uh, so again, what it does is it gives people a second chance who've done something stupid and it allows us to devote our resources to the violent crime that uh, has a big impact on the community. Okay, let's switch gears. Um, and talk about heroin, opioid use, um, opioid use disorder, uh, and fentanyl, which is really what we're seeing now. Um, these are the number of possession cases. Uh, and I only put those numbers up there to show you 
how extensive this problem is and how it's become in just the last 10 years. In June of 2013, there were 57 pending possession cases, uh, whether heroin or fentanyl, in uh, just in May of this year, 229. It's a huge increase. The reason those increase in prescription pill cases are important is that uh, prescription pills are a precursor to opioid use, to, to heroin use or fentanyl use. Four out of five uh, opioid users uh, get addicted uh, to heroin. Um, or I should say four out of five heroin users began their addiction using opioids. Uh, and what we're seeing now is we're seeing fentanyl mixed into cocaine, it's mixed into marijuana, uh, and fentanyl is incredibly addictive and it's very powerful, and unfortunately, uh, people die from it. Uh, we had over 150 opioid overdose deaths uh, in DuPage County in 2022. So it is a very disturbing trend, uh, and we've been out in front of this for a long time. Our coroner, uh, Rich Jorgensen, uh, has been out in front of it. We've appeared in front of many community groups trying to educate the public. And unfortunately, this is a problem that's just going to take time. Uh, I look back to see at the progress we've made on drunk driving. That took 30 years of an intense nationwide public campaign, a public education campaign about drinking and driving. And we finally are starting to see the results of that, especially uh, in our under 25 year olds. I hope that it doesn't take 30 years before we see a huge decrease uh, in these cases, but I believe that our approach uh, is the correct approach. Now, we do treat drug users and drug dealers very differently, uh, and we do hold drug dealers accountable, especially if we can prove that a drug dealer sold drugs to someone, they use them, uh, and they die of an overdose. Uh, that's called drug-induced homicide. So anytime there's a drug over overdose in the county, our coroner notifies my office and also notifies the local police agency, and we investigate every single one of them. Uh, and we try and find the source of the drugs. Uh, you can see the number of cases, 25 since 2015. Um, now, it may seem like a lot, but. It, doesn't compare to the drug overdose deaths, obviously it's a smaller number, and it just shows you the challenges of proving these cases. Because many of our witnesses are in fact drug dealers, and we do try and work our way up uh, to the bigger drug dealers. But when we can prove it, we do charge them uh, because I believe that drug dealers need to be held accountable. All right, I talked a little bit about the Children's Center earlier. Um, the Janina Carrico Children's Center, uh, we. Uh, built a br brand new building in the county. We just celebrated its 10 year anniversary uh, a few months ago. The number of cases, unfortunately, that the center has taken in, uh, you can see the increase. 293 in 2019, and we're up 25%, uh, 367 cases that were accepted in 2022. We have full-time investigators who are staff, who staff the center, we have case managers that work with the victim's family, and I have some of my strongest trial attorneys who are in this unit uh, to both investigate, charge, and prosecute these cases. I can tell you that when it comes to both physical and sexual abuse against children, those are crimes that know no boundaries. They're in every single community in this county. Um, they cross all economic lines, uh, and they are very disturbing cases. Uh, our children are our most vulnerable, um, and uh, we take the cases very seriously. We work the cases with the local police agency, uh, and we work, we work it hand in hand. And um, we have two Spanish-speaking investigators at the center, um, and it is, uh, it's a model for other counties, uh, the work that we're doing at our children's center. All right, let's talk about child support. We'll switch gears for a second because um, many people in the community don't realize that we also prosecute deadbeat parents uh, in this county. I think we're one of 11 counties in the state of Illinois 
that do their own child support prosecution. The Attorney General handles uh, uh, the prosecution in the other counties. We just got a five-year contract from the state of Illinois to fund this unit uh, a year ago. Uh, when Initially, when I came to the county, uh, we had uh, four uh, attorneys plus two doing the expedited call, so six in total, six attorneys in child support. We're down to three right now, along with three paralegals, and we bring in close to $40 million a year in unpaid child support. The goal here, when I say prosecute these cases, we're not locking deadbeat parents up unless it's a means to force them to pay money that they're ordered to pay that they haven't been paying. Uh, and we do a great job of collecting this money for single parents. And I don't have to tell you what a difference it makes uh, in the community, um, but they do incredible work. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, the Safety Act, all right? Uh, a number of components to the Safety Act, some of which went into effect uh, over a year ago, uh, some of which recently went into effect. Some of the biggest components are the police certification. All police have to be certified now through the state of Illinois, uh, and the requirement that all police officers wear body-worn cameras. I'll talk about that in a second. I'm a huge proponent of body-worn cameras. The evidence that we get is incredible, and it makes a lot of our cases much stronger. It results in more pleas of guilty, and it either supports what the police are saying, or it doesn't. Uh, and fortunately, in this county, in almost all the cases, it does support what they're saying. Um, elimination of cash bail, I'm going to talk about that in a second, and uh, some of the changes with failing to appear in violation of bail bond uh, no longer being a separate offense. So, when the original Safety Act was passed, uh, there was a lot of criticism uh, from prosecutors. I was one of those prosecutors who criticized that component of the law uh, because this is what the original law said um, on top, all right? In order to detain someone under the original Safety Act, uh, which is not the law that's in effect right now, we would have to prove and judges would have to find that a person posed a specific real and present threat to a person or had a high likelihood of willful flight. And then at each and every court date, a judge would have to find that the person was a threat to a specific named individual, which is extremely difficult to do, especially in a domestic homicide situation where the victim is deceased. Who is that person? Who's the person that they're a threat to? We were very critical of it, uh, and fortunately, a group was put together in late 2022, uh, and I was asked to be part of that group. Uh, if you recall, there were 68 state attorneys that filed a lawsuit, and there were three of us that were part of this group to create this amendment. We spent eight weeks, uh, sometimes eight hours a week, four-hour Zoom calls twice a week, reviewing language, and coming up with changes uh, to draft this amendment. Uh, the three state's attorneys that sat on that group uh, was myself, uh, Jamie Mosser, the Kane County State's Attorney, and Julia Reitz from Champaign County. And um, I will tell you this, that uh, things got a little heated at times, but we got a lot accomplished. And in December of 2022, in the waning hours of the General Assembly, uh, they passed House Bill 1095, which was the amended version of the law. Uh, it was upheld by this Illinois Supreme Court, and the elimination of cash bail component went into effect on September 18th uh, of this year. That's the biggest change in the law right there, that judges now can detain someone, not just if they're a threat to a specific person, but if they're a threat to the community. And if you just use the example of, let's say somebody goes in and robs a 7-Eleven at gunpoint, and it's a crime of opportunity. They don't know the person who works at the 7-Eleven. Um, be very hard for us to prove that they're a threat to a specific person, right? They don't even know the name of the victim, but we can prove 
based on the facts of the case and maybe based on their history that they're a threat to the community. And if, uh, if judges find they're a threat to the community and find that there are no other conditions uh, that can protect the community, conditions of release, um, they can hold people now without the ability to post bond. So the crimes that you see on the left under the original Safety Act, the only way to have detained those, those offenses were if someone was a willful flight risk, not under the dangerousness standard. Now, all those crimes on the right are detainable under a dangerousness standard or willful risk of flight, uh, including robbery, aggravated robbery, arson, kidnapping, threatening a public official, hate crimes. Because initially, under the original law, if you could get probation for a forcible felony, uh, you could not be detained under the dangerousness standard. So this was really one of the biggest changes uh, in the law. The other big change was the definition of willful flight. Initially, under the original Safety Act, willful flight meant planning or attempting to intentionally evade prosecution by concealing oneself. And prior instances of not appearing in court were not admissible to prove that someone was a flight risk. So someone, let's say, who's missed court 20 times before, we wouldn't be able to introduce that evidence. Um, it can now be considered under the new definition of willful flight, which is part of the amendment. So now willful flight means intentional conduct with a purpose to thwart the judicial process to avoid prosecution. So that doesn't include someone who misses the bus, right, um, or uh, can't make their way to court, but it does include the people who have taken off because they're not going to appear in court. Um, and prior instances of not appearing in court are admissible if there's a pattern of them to show a pattern of missing court. So how is it working out in this county? Safety Act. Well, since September 18th, I'm happy to say I think it's actually working incredibly well. Uh, we have filed a total, as of October 30th, of 178 petitions. So in order to detain any defendant, the state's attorney has to file a petition. Without a petition, a judge does not have discretion. We are filing petitions in almost every eligible case where we think it's appropriate. 84 of those have been granted and 94 have been denied. So it's about 47% uh, of the total petitions uh, are being granted. The interesting thing is the number of domestic battery cases. These are misdemeanor domestic batteries. And in the past, prior to the Safety Act, almost all of these defendants would post bond and get out. Now you can see how many of them are actually getting detained uh, on domestic batteries. And clearly the reason for that is they are a threat uh, to a specific person. And there's really a concern in any domestic battery situation that the uh, behavior could escalate. So that is uh, one of the strong parts of the act is it's very strong on domestic violence cases. And the, these numbers uh, actually show that judges truly are using their discretion, which I've been a huge proponent of from the very beginning. Uh, I continue and will continue to push for the New Jersey model when it comes to cash bail. In 2017, New Jersey eliminated cash bail, but their law gives judges discretion in every criminal case to detain someone if they're a threat to the community or uh, likely to obstruct justice or intimidate witnesses or flee. And all of the stakeholders in New Jersey uh, agree that that law is working very well. So we are hopeful when the General Assembly goes back in January uh, that some amendments will be made to give judges more discretion uh, because we've had a handful of cases here where I know that uh, our judges were frustrated and felt that their hands were tied uh, because they didn't have that discretion. And I'm a huge believer 
that it's judges who hear cases all the time, who know what the rules of evidence are, they're the ones who should be making uh, these decisions. There are um, 27 cases that are on appeal right now. So the law allows either side to appeal a decision on detention or release. All 27 of those cases were filed by the defendants. Uh, we, meaning the state, we have not filed one appeal yet, uh, which shows you the confidence I have in our judges in this county. Uh, we have not gotten any decisions back yet from our third district appellate court uh, regarding those appeals. So on September 18th, when the law went into effect, uh, there was a big question, okay, so what happens to all the people who were in jail on a cash bond and they still haven't posted? The way the amendment was set up was this. A defense attorney has to file a petition and request a hearing because uh, we kind of all collectively decided that let's say someone was in bond, uh, was in custody for a robbery, their bond was 100,000 and they have to post 10,000. Let's say they had $9,000 saved up and they were, they were expecting to get another 1,000 in the next two weeks. The defense attorney would have had the option and has the option of holding off on asking for a hearing because at a hearing, they may be detained without the ability to post bond. So many defense attorneys are waiting to see if their, their clients will in fact post the cash bond. So they have the option to proceed under the cash bond statute or to proceed under the new law. We have done um, 91 hearings uh, for defendants who requested them, and as you could see, 66 of those um, were still detained. They were, they were granted. 25 of them uh, were released. Most of those defendants were released were cases where they're simply not eligible uh, to be detained. They were charged, let's say, with retail theft or organized retail crime or some other property crime, and we couldn't show that they were a flight risk. Uh, so they were released. But again, uh, those numbers show um, that judges are using their discretion. So you've got three requirements in order to detain someone, all right? Uh, number one, state has to prove that the proof is evident or the presumption great that the defendant committed the crime. Uh, number two, that the defendant poses a real and present threat to either a person, persons, or the community based on the specific articulable facts of the case. Um, and then three, no combination or combination, no condition or combination of conditions can mitigate that threat to the community. And if the judge finds that those three factors exist, then uh, the judge will detain the defendant without the ability to post bond. And on each and every court date, they have to make that finding in order to continue detention uh, until the trial takes place. As I stated before, there are still some crimes where judges don't have discretion uh, to detain under the dangerousness standard. Uh, and those include burglary, not residential burglary, but burglary to an automobile, burglary to a business, possession of a stolen motor vehicle, uh, retail theft or organized retail crime, uh, an identity theft under $100,000. Those are some examples of crimes that are still not detainable under a dangerousness standard. And as I stated before, uh, we're hopeful to get an amendment to the law to give judges more discretion. All right, go back to body-worn cameras. These, we have a system in place, it's called TechShare. It's a, um, it's, it's a software system. So the way it works is the police upload all of their body camera video, video uh, from statements from witnesses and the offenders, uh, photographs, medical records, police reports, they upload all of that information into TechShare and then we are able to have access to it and we make it accessible to the defense attorney on that given case. They all have a code to get into the system and they can view it, they can download it, same with, with us. Uh, I can 
from home on my laptop, I can pull up any case and I can read the police reports, I can view the body camera video from my living room or even my iPhone. Um, it's a great system. You can see the number of body-worn camera uploads that we've seen since we started using body-worn cameras. I, I am a huge proponent of the evidence, but if you just take a typical DUI where we used to get a six-page police report and maybe uh, a video of the offender doing field sobriety tests, it's maybe a 20-minute video. Now, in addition to that report in that 20-minute video, we may get six hours of body camera evidence, and we have to watch all of it. And so does the defense attorney. So as a result, um, I made a request to the county board uh, to allow me to hire more prosecutors, and they did that. And they gave our public defender, Jeff York, they granted his same request to hire more public defenders so that we can view all of this evidence. Um, and as I said before, the system is working incredibly well. The police departments have, uh, uh, depending on the size of the department, up until January 1st of 2025 for the bigger departments to acquire the body-worn cameras. Many of our departments got online way early, and most of them uh, already have these cameras in place. Okay, um, let's talk about firearm restraining orders. Uh, this is a mechanism that allows us to take someone to court and get an order from a judge to remove all guns and ammunition from their home and safeguard them until such time that they're able to get them back. It's a red flag law. One of the few laws that was passed in Springfield with overwhelming bipartisan support, and it went into effect January 1st, 2019. Uh, we were prepared for this law before it went into effect. We were the first county in the state of Illinois to create the forms used by the court before the Administrative Office of Illinois Courts uh, created a standardized form. There's 374 of these orders have been granted in the entire state of Illinois, and out of those 374, 95 of them right here in DuPage County. 25% of the entire state total. Uh, family members or police are the ones who can go to court and get these orders. And we almost always get the police involved because if an order is granted and there's evidence that someone has guns or guns, a gun or guns in a particular location, a judge can issue a search warrant and it's the police that are going to be executing that warrant. The law says that the state's attorney may assist in granting these orders. Uh, we assist in every case and we go up as a friend of the court uh, and we advocate uh, for these cases. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of this law because what it does is uh, we we remove guns from people who are experiencing a serious crisis. Many of these cases involve uh, people who are suicidal or cases of domestic violence where they're violent. And the thing about this law is it still uh, requires a hearing and a, uh, an order from a judge so it protects people's constitutional rights. Um, and as I said, uh, it got bipartisan support when it passed. Okay, a little bit about school safety. We have a school safety task force uh, that has been meeting for many years now, uh, made up of many people in the community, including our sheriff's office, um, a behavioral specialist, many of our police departments, and superintendents. Uh, and we've done some great work, not only hardening our schools, but being proactive, trying to intervene in kids who are experiencing crises. And we try and get them help before it turns into something violent. A few years ago, we started an, aid, uh, an agency called MERIT, which is Metropolitan Enforcement, or I'm sorry, Metropolitan Emergency Response Investigative Team. And it's a task force made up of the best of the best police officers throughout the county. And they respond to all major crimes. So um, anytime there's a major crime, like a murder, we've got the best of the best responding. 
We took that model and we brought it to the schools and we created what we call DoSmart. So now the bigger school districts can give resources to the smaller districts anytime there's an emergency and they need help. And it doesn't have to be an act of violence, it could be a weather-related emergency, but they can do it legally um, the same way that the police have their task force. Uh, and we just put this together. Uh, it's the first of its kind in the state of Illinois uh, to, to have a model like this. And we got buy-in from all of the private attorneys uh, who represent the school districts. They actually helped us draft the agreement um, for all the districts. Uh, and it's just another example of how we do things collectively in the county for the betterment of the public. Okay, our um, Family Violence Coordinating Council created a QR code for victims of domestic violence. Uh, this is something that we recently did. Historically, uh, the police would give victims a sheet of paper that has a list of all these resources. Well, many times they can lose that, or worse, uh, the perpetrator can find that, um, that sheet of paper uh, and uh, that can create problems in the home. Now victims have a QR code that they can put on their phone and it takes them to what we call a dummy web page um, that has nothing to do with domestic violence, but they know how and where to click to get those resources right on their phone and they can store that information. And all the police departments have these cards uh, with the QR code that they are giving uh, to victims of domestic violence. Okay, um, a little bit before we turn it over for questions, uh, I want to talk about Fight Crime Investing Kids, which is a group that I'm a member of. It's made up of over 300 prosecutors, uh, police officers, and sheriffs throughout the state of Illinois. We advocate for funding for programs uh, that help young families, young children, and all the research shows it keeps them out of the justice system uh, and reduces crime. Uh, so I am on the executive board. Uh, this is an op-ed that uh, was published in the Chicago Tribune and another one that was published in the uh, Sun-Times. And uh, in the next few days, hopefully there's going to be another one published in the Daily Herald uh, regarding fight crime investing kids uh, and some of these programs, which include high quality preschools and after school care uh, and it's keeping kids out of our criminal justice system. All right, last thing is uh, the opioid lawsuit uh, has brought in so far over $2.2 million uh, to DuPage County. Um, and that is money that can be used for abatement. And uh, the county board just voted uh, to use a large chunk of that money for our county crisis recovery center. Uh, which is going to be built shortly, and it ensures that all DuPage County residents will have someone to call, someone to respond, uh, and somewhere to go when experiencing some type of a either mental health or, uh, or drug use disorder uh, problem. All right, in conclusion, uh, I always conclude with a quote from Berger versus United States. This is a Supreme Court case in 1935, uh, and it talks about prosecutors and the responsibility that we have. Uh, and what it says is that prosecutors should prosecute with earnestness, and uh, we may strike hard blows, and indeed uh, we should. It's our duty to, but it's also our duty uh, to not strike foul blows, and it's our duty to protect uh, people from wrongful prosecution as much as it is to ensure that uh, we, we get justice in every case. And justice doesn't always mean a guilty verdict. Sometimes, as you've seen, uh, justice means something else. And that's something that we try and achieve uh, in every single case in the office. So hopefully we got time for questions. Yes, thank you so much. Sure. Um, do, um, Galen, do we have any questions from our virtual attendees? Yes, can you hear me? Okay. 
Um, the, the question we have um, from Zoom is, is there concern that increased judge discretion for detainment might yield more opportunity for racism? Um, I don't believe that that is a real concern uh, here in this county because of the quality of the judiciary that we have. Um, I think judges are making decisions on a case-by-case -case basis, which is what the General Assembly really wanted. And I think the numbers, uh, not only in this county, but so far the numbers that I'm seeing from uh, the surrounding counties around the state show that judges, in fact, are using their discretion. They don't agree with us in every case, but they're trying to detain only those who are truly a threat to the community. Thank you. We have a question of, um, does Do Smart include private schools also? It does not include private schools only because of the public funding involved. And I know that is a concern that we have and we're trying to find a mechanism uh, to bring the private schools in, but that's the reason for it is because of the public money. Many are interested in obtaining your slides, and so I just want to say that a copy of this recording will be posted on the League of Women Voters website, the Wheaton League of Women Voters website, so you'll, you'll be able to get and see all the statistics once again. Um, one more question. Thank you for sharing the stats about how the Safety Act is operating. Are you keeping track of the uh, racial breakdown or ethnicity of the defendants who are being detained or released? Is that anything that's being considered? That is something that I know our circuit court clerk uh, has to um, uh, keep track of. Um, so that is something w that they are doing. Uh, but we historically in our office have not kept track of either uh, race or gender of offenders or victims. Thank you. Um, one other question. Do offenders have to live in DuPage County for some of the special courts? that you mentioned at the beginning, the diversion courts and things? Great question, uh, and yes, they do. And, and the reason for that is because um, they're accessing our resources, uh, and they need to be closer in order to not only get to court, but to see their probation officer or get their counseling. So that is a uh, requirement. Thank you. Galen, any more questions from our virtual guests? Yes. Does your office have restorative justice programs for homicide cases? If so, could you share more about that? So uh, the answer is uh, we don't. Um, and the reason is, is that um, homicide is a violent crime, um, and I believe that violent crime should be handled differently. Uh, we do a lot of restorative justice for nonviolent offenses, uh, but homicides armed robberies, carjackings, crimes with guns, uh, I think have to be handled differently and we take a different approach. There's someone who's wondering just what a good general definition of restorative justice is. It's, um, it's, the, it's what we call the BARGE philosophy and BARGE stands for uh, balance and restorative justice. What it is, is you, your Obtaining accountability, so uh, you're holding offenders accountable, but the, it's not, uh, the punishment is not punitive. The punishment is to restore them uh, to citizenship, uh, to get them back on the street. So it is giving them a second chance, but it's providing offenders with the tools and resources they need to be successful and hopefully not reoffend. And it looks like, by the statistics, it's successful. In this county, uh, I think we've been very successful at it. But again, um, it's a team approach. It's not just our office. We have, we've got a great probation department uh, and, and, and great defense attorneys. I mean, uh, we, just, we are resource heavy in this county, and we're very fortunate. Um, one last question. Um, it, in a, in, it's kind of from different people. It, do you see a trend increasing for carjacking or hate crimes? Is that a future concern for the county? So if, um, if you recall the slide dealing with the number of carjackings, um, they were on the increase 
uh, up and through, I think, 2021, uh, and now they've started going back down. Uh, so um, for, uh, we're very fortunate. I think a lot of that is the approach we take uh, to those crimes. And uh, regarding hate crimes, we have been extremely fortunate here in this county. Uh, we have not seen, we've seen hate crimes, uh, and we, we charge them, we prosecute them, uh, but knock on wood, we have not seen any real increase with all of what's going on in the world right now. Um, and that's, uh, I feel very fortunate to say that, um, but I think it's a testament to the people in this county. To end on a positive note, what's the most positive thing you see happening in your office? So um, I just think when you look at the results that we're obtaining, um, we're a county of close to a million people. And uh, we, we have on average between five and 10 murders a year. And most of those are either domestic violence or a mental health crisis, in many cases both. Uh, when you look at what we're doing and the effect that it's having in crime reduction, um, that's a real positive. Uh, crime has a huge impact on the community in ways that cannot be measured uh, monetarily. Uh, you know, somebody breaks into a house on your block, what does that do to the entire neighborhood? People are afraid. And no one should feel afraid to go to sleep at night or to go walk out of their house in the day and do whatever they're about to do. And um, that's a real positive. Um, I can tell you right now, here it is, what, almost 8 p.m. There are numerous assistant state's attorneys who are still at the office tonight, and they'll be there uh, on the weekend um, because they're committed. We all are committed to keeping everyone safe. Thank you so much. Everyone, please join me in thanking. Thank you. Mr. Berlin for being with us tonight. Hi, I just have to take the time to say, um, after s seven years ago, the Civic Awareness Series began here at Cantini. We've had 75 speakers and over 10,000 viewers or attendees attending the programs during that time. And the fact is, is that this is the last program that we're planning on having at Cantini at the current time. So it's with sadness, but with deep gratitude, I say thanks to Jeff Ritter, an unseen hero who has sent out the communications for all of our programs so that people know what's going on. Galen Piper, who's the director of public programming, who's encouraged us to continue, and, and hopefully we'll see her in, again in the future. We could not survive without Andrew and his partner, Dominic, who are the people behind the scenes who handle all that equipment to make the hybrid programs possible and to keep us running during COVID. We, uh, but the, we have to also thank Chris Corrigan, who's no longer with Cantini, but who has become a lifelong friend and an honorary member of the League of Women Voters. But most importantly, I really do have to thank Will Bulig, the Director of Collections and Operations, and Matt LaFond, the Executive Director of the Park, who met with myself and another League member seven years ago and took a chance on developing the Civic Awareness Series because they feel, felt that it was in the Colonel McCormick's vein of thought that issues should be discussed and presented to the neighbors and his community. And that's what we've been able to do for the last seven years. So thank you all for all of you who have attended. Thank you to Cantini for being such a gracious host for the program. My husband's kind of excited that I don't, I'm not trying to get speakers all the time. But we will continue and I hope you keep track of the Wheaton League website and we'll be able to let you know when future programming takes place. So thank you all again for tonight. Thank you again for being our last speaker and Mr. Berlin and travel safely home. Thank you.